And a very good morning, good afternoon uh, to all of you who have joined and also welcome to the to this event where we'll be doing two, uh, two uh, things. One is we'll be announcing the, the Salim ul -Haq scholarship panelist and understanding more about what they're going to be researching on. And the second is we'll be launching the Comprehensive Climate Impact Quantification Toolkit. And for for all of us, probably today is a uh, a very momentous day for two reasons. One is remembering Salim uh, because one, you know, obviously he was a figure which probably all of us know as a stalwart, as a champion, a global advocate for the issues of poorer communities and countries. Uh, and uh, and and more than anything, we do feel the void that he has created especially with with his passing and especially we know that bridge that gap cannot be bridged but at the same time the only way we can honor his memory and his legacy is by not stopping not slowing down but carrying forward in all those effort that he had initiated and one of them was the the all act initiative the, uh, the alliance for locally led transformative action for loss and damage this initiative not many of you may know was something that we started about five years back where we uh, at that time loss and damage was quite a controversial issue it was a, a, a sticky issue i would say not many donors came forward uh, with funding support for this but even with very limited funding we launched uh, a, a series of deliberative dialogue at that time and the whole idea was, and that again was something that came from Salim, was we don't just need to engage with the people who are within the climate change domain, but we need to engage with the people who are in the development space, especially those who are the first responders when a climate crisis strikes. For example, the people who are manag managing the social protection, health initiative, uh, the DRR work, and so on. And that led to really coming out with very strong um, messages from from all of those actors was what kind of action and support is needed, how it can be delivered and financed. And, and with that collective wisdom uh, of all of them, we co-created this initiative called All Act. And there are a few building blocks that you would see on the screen there. But most importantly, the idea was that how can we directly support? Because at that time when we started, the loss and damage fund had been announced, but it wasn't resourced. And at that time, we thought that how can we really directly support the countries and communities which are already experiencing loss and damage, allowing them to optimize whatever sources of funding they have. So how do we really bring together or harmonize the governance of existing sources of finance, expertise, and also strengthen the existing delivery mechanism so that they're more agile, they're more uh, anticipatory uh, in delivering the support to the community, but at the same time also builds longer term resilience. Uh, and the whole idea was that we strengthen these, these countries and delivery, especially at their delivery mechanism in a way that whenever new funding uh, opportunities come up, especially the loss and damage fund, then they can easily deploy or use some of those existing models um, of practical solutions or delivery arrangement and put the resources behind them. Uh, and most importantly, the idea was that through this initiative, it come out with locally appropriate, locally led solution that are most relevant for the communities which were really suffering the impact of climate change. So with that, I'll just stop here. And uh, I would really, um, like to hear the 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 views of some of the experts in this field and um, and to begin with i'll first invite shakib Haq, who's the managing director of international center for climate change and development ecad uh, with whom uh, we jointly launched this initiative so shakib uh, over to you thank you ritu and thank you to all our colleagues and friends for joining us for the the launch of the scholarship award as well as the the comprehensive um, toolkit as well um, i'm very delighted and grateful for all of you in our, our journey for the scholarship award as ritu mentioned this was something that uh, my father dr salim mulhak had uh, championed quite a lot in terms of trying to um, bring out the global south researchers and having a voice in in the level of international discourse and policy making as well as on implementation oftentimes one of the challenges that we used to identify very early on was that 
a lot of the Global South activities, particularly in LDCs and small island states, were being done through plans and frameworks and methodologies that weren't developed in situ. They were not necessarily built with colleagues and friends from those particular regions, from those communities. And that was one of the lackings that quite a lot of the earlier reports on um, climate science was really, really um, criticized for. One of the earlier sort of um, remarks that come out from many of the, the frameworks and um, adaptation initiatives that had started in the Global South were failed because they didn't take into consideration the community involvement, how they can be really championed as leaders, taking leadership in the activities that they're doing and getting to know about the intricacies of their own context. Adaptation is very, very context specific. Loss and damage will also be very, very context specific. It will change and look different in different circumstances, even if the regions are very, very close to each other. And so it's very important for us as an initiative to try and bring out those voices, bring those community voices coming in on peer reviewed research, on um, articles, on journals, on blogs, being able to get them to speak in the language that they're speaking in, write in the language that they're writing in, but bring that to the international forum so that we can make a comprehensive thinking when we do these international treaties and international policies, particularly from the, the UN Convention on Climate, but also on the surrounding conventions on biodiversity, on desertification, on on um, disaster management and so many other areas that climate will be impacting and these communities will need to be resilient they will need to adapt they will need to address their own losses and damages so a lot of these issues have previously been done away from the global south being directly involved there are cases of many individuals like my father himself being researchers from the global south writing and publishing with with co-authors elsewhere but there were always research papers that were hosted in publications or publishing houses or even in institutions that were in the global north so you had to be partnered somewhere in the global north to really be able to make that higher tier of publications that the ipcc and other um, international forums draw from so if you look at some many of the cl climate conventions a lot of the international reporting the international research and knowledge and evidence the ipcc in particular really have a high standard of research and publications that you need to be able to be included into that research report into those assessments and many times global south researchers struggle to be able to break in through that barrier so one of the areas that we're really hoping throughout the, the scholarship award is to be able to nurture and mentor more global south researchers in being able to go past that barrier and be able to publish on their own activities, on their, on their own communities, perhaps even co-develop research where they're able to actually talk with the community members, not just about them and publish on their behalf, but with them in collaboration with them. And again, we, we take this as a journey. This isn't something that um, we're taking out as our brainchild and just throwing it out for everybody else to follow suit. We would really like your feedback and inputs on different areas and different ways that we might be able to bring in researchers, other young career researchers that we should be exploring it through our own networks. And we really hope that in future calls for the awards, all of you are able to really share it amongst your co collaborators or amongst your colleagues into your own research network so we can get a bro broader pool of people coming in from all the different Global South representatives that we have. So I'm really delighted and very, very grateful on behalf of my family and our ACAD family for all of your support and guidance throughout this effort, particularly to Ritu and Tom for taking the initiative for the scholarship award. And um, I look forward to many of more interactions coming forward. Thank you so much. Back to you, Ritu. Thank you so much, Shakib. And uh, I still remember the day when we launched this uh, All Act initiative. Um, and especially, uh, you know, every, every time I keep remembering what Salim mentioned uh, about really valuing the local experts, because for us, the most insightful experts are those who are already uh, at, the, at, the, at the front line of these climatic impact and helping communities manage, manage these, uh, the, these issues. So with that, I'll move on to Tom, because Tom also played a very important role when we, when we first launched this initiative. Um, and Tom has been really uh, supporting this whole uh, effort right from the beginning. So over to you, Tom. Tom, uh, many of you would know already, he's the, he's the executive director of IIED. Um, and, and over to you. Thank you, Ritu, and, and thank you to Saqib. Um, so, yes, a few things. So, Salim was a long-standing member of IIED. He established IIED's climate change program, um, really did break ground for the organization and has remained 
uh, up until his passing, a very close collaborator and friend uh, of IIED. And certainly since I joined IIED a couple of years ago, we've really sought to reinforce our partnership with ICAD and, and with uh, and with Saqib. Um, and with that, I think it was in some ways a no-brainer that in Salim's passing, we wanted to um, honour his legacy of being a real champion of of uh, researchers, of young people, of those wanting to raise their voice and have themselves heard from different parts of the world that don't normally uh, have that platform. And to, as Saqib said, kind of break through um, in order to be able to have that voice heard and the evidence and research represented in the UNFCCC and in the IPCC and in national policies and plans to tackle loss and damage and, and locally and so on. That was a really important part of what Salim wanted to achieve. And I think the scholarship scheme is very much in that vision. And we hope that um, the recipients of the scheme and the, the scheme as it goes on in years to come will help to honor the legacy and the vision of, of what um, Salim was, was able to bring to the international community and to many people um, who work closely with him. So this is a long-term commitment. This is not a case of we'll have some recipients in year one and then the scheme will disappear. The organizations hosting this are committed to this for the long term and to build the capability of, of those, as others have said, really do see the issues day to day in the communities that they work with and are the best voices and uh, and interpreters of those um, contexts for the international community and elsewhere. There's a couple of other things I want to stress just by way of welcome here. The first is huge congratulations to those who are here today as recipients of the scholarship and 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 come through what has been a competitive process. And I know Ritu will come on to talk about that. But also big thank you to everybody who's supporting this or with mentorship or with funding or with um, oversight and support and communication. You know, there's a lot of people that we need to acknowledge go into building something that we hope is going to sustain over, over many years. The second is, you know, we really do have a goal here, both in building capability and confidence of those who are scholarship recipients, but also bringing that evidence to the table that can shape how the world tackles loss and damage. And that's why I hope we're going to go on um, later to hear from representatives of the IPCC and those who are currently stewarding legal cases through the courts around climate damage and so on, just to help reinforce how important it is to get this evidence to be of a high standard, to have really clear voices and to build it into key policy processes. And so with that in mind, the scholarship has multiple objectives. And I think we want to acknowledge and uh, and and support those multiple objectives as we go forward and test how we do. And your feedback in that is crucial. One last thing that I just want to, to recognize is that um, this scholarship scheme is one where it's not just about a set of individuals um, and a set of recipients who will um, see benefits personally and hopefully for their communities. But it also is in the spirit of All Act. And All Act, as Ritu said at the start, is a commitment to the fact that multiple organizations at multiple scales need to work together to help scale up practical approaches to tackle loss and damage. And it is with that what we want to be able to do is also to strengthen the network of organizations committed to advancing and scaling those practical solutions, because without it, we effectively rely on an international system that is not yet delivering what we need it to deliver. And therefore, the opportunity that we have is to bind together, to find practical solutions, to bring the strength of our organizations together. And that is the spirit of All Act. And so as a key component of an All Act initiative, something that we launched together with Salim just some 18 months ago, um, we really do want to uh, do want to to build on the strengths of everyone, and particularly those working um, with practical challenges at the front lines of climate change. So, a big thank you to you, Ritu, and to the team that's immediately worked on this. Really do look forward to hearing from colleagues and, and recipients around the table. Thank you, uh, Tom. And with that, I'll move on to hearing more from our experts, uh, especially the two keynote speakers that we have. And first, I'll uh, request. Uh, Zinta Zomers, uh, who's uh, vice chair uh, of the working group two of Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, 
And she's also the lead of climate science at the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. So Zinta, over to you. Great. Well, well, thank you very much, everyone. And it's a great pleasure to be able to join you. Um, as Ritu has explained, I'm the vice chair of working group two of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. So that's the group that focuses on impacts and adaptation. And as vice chairs, we largely play a role in advising the Bureau and in helping select uh, authors and steer and plan the work for the next cycle of assessments, which just started. So we're so thrilled that we can join today to welcome the scholars. Um, I worked actually personally with Salim over many years, and he was uh, a mentor of mine as well. And I'm thrilled that his legacy will continue to grow through all of your, your work. And your work is particularly important now because, as I mentioned, with the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, we're just starting the AR7 cycle. And to flag for you some key things that we'll be looking for in this cycle, first, we really do hope that we'll be able to cover loss and damage more fully in both the main working group report and in um, other uh, documents that we produce. And, and for that, we really do need uh, extensive literature uh, and, and the results of your studies. We also will be revising the technical guide guidelines on impacts and adaptation that were developed in 1994. And this will include updating adapt methods that we use for adaptation, updating um, suggestions on what scenarios to use, and um, making suggestions on how to assess impacts. So again, uh, the, the tool also that you'll be launching today are, are very, is very relevant for this. And thirdly, we really hope that this report and this cycle of IPCC reports will provide very practical advice and uh, lessons from case studies on what works, so real support for decision-making. And you'll see in the background of, of my video, um, the special report on cities is another report that will be launched with input from all three working groups, but this is a very good example of, we really need local level insights and uh, solutions. And for those of you who are focusing on cities, the call for authors for this report is actually just open now. So I really encourage all of you to apply. And this is particularly important because we, we really do want to have a greater diversity of representatives and insights from uh, those working and living in uh, SIDS and, and LDCs. And so I think obviously whatever evidence and insight your work can produce and the scholarship um, produces is so critical uh, to our work. Uh, I've reviewed quickly a little bit about um, each of those of you who are selected to be scholars, I congratulate you. I looked at some of the topics of research. It's astounding what you'll be covering and um, from social disruption to health, to cultural loss and looking at the loss of quality of life. These are things that obviously in my day job with the UN Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, we deal with um, the implications of that uh, every day and really are looking for um, insights on both what's happening, but also what are the solutions to some of these challenges and how do we better support communities and individuals dealing with, with these things. So I look forward to seeing the results of your work and congratulations again. And regarding the CCIQ toolkit, well, I'm very excited to learn more about this. Again, I see this as something that we can use very practically in, in with the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, where we really do look to engage with local communities and are looking at what methods we could use, how do we do economic valuation of some of the impacts um, and the response measures that are needed. So, so again, um, very excited to, to see what tools you have already available for us to use in our day-to-day -day work. So I'll end there, but just to say congratulations, and I look forward to interacting, hopefully, with all of you uh, through the IPCC as authors, reviewers, um, commentators, or, or potentially an approval session. So congratulations, and and let's let's be in touch. Thank you so much, Zenta, and and really for your kind words of encouragement as well. We'll be looking forward to collaborating both on the IPCC as well as your uh, uh, your. Uh, uh, your role uh, in the UN uh, Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. So with that, I move on to Harsh Narula. Uh, and many of you may already know him because he's one of those stalwarts uh, in the space of climate litigation. You know, he's one of the 
first ones to um, to to really work in this space and he's in is a is a, a global expert on climate uh, on public interest climate law and litigation we also have him uh, uh, as part of the IAD board of trustees so we keep uh, benefiting from his wisdom so over to you harj and uh, look forward to hearing more about what your thoughts are thanks ritu um and good afternoon everyone it's a real pleasure to to be here for the launch of the scholarship and and the the toolkit um yeah i wanted to to first also offer my congratulations to uh, all of the scholarship recipients um I think it's a really big achievement to receive this this award. It was a very competitive process um, <clears throat> to get to this stage. And like Zinta, I was really um, impressed with the the quality of the research that you, you'll all be doing based on the, the summaries that I've seen. Um, so I also wanted to congratulate everyone at, at ICAD and um, IED for establishing uh, this scholarship and for publishing the, the toolkit. Um, I think obviously uh, this is a really fantastic way to honor the memory of Salim um, and really in keeping with his transformative work in, in the field of, of loss and damage. So uh, I wanted to cover three points today. Um, so I'll start with sharing a little bit more information about my legal work um, in climate litigation and how the research that you are all doing can support legal efforts to address uh, loss and damage. I'll then offer two examples of, of this, focusing specifically on uh, climate displacement and cultural loss. So I act um, as a lawyer, as Ritu was saying, uh, in climate change cases. So these are cases that are brought against both governments and corporations on a range of climate change related issues. A lot of that work has um, historically focused on uh, mitigation, but increasingly we're seeing the emergence of loss and damage as a real focus for climate change litigation. Um, so most of my work is in the, the global south, um, in South Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Pacific. And um, I'm currently representing the Solomon Islands in a case before the International Court of Justice on climate change. Um, so that case is um, uh, before the, the biggest court in the world, and it has 91 different countries participating in it. And it was begun after a campaign um, by Vanuatu and SIDS and LDCs to have um, this court address the issue of, of climate change. And one of the really key issues in that case is essentially around which states are liable for the harm created by climate change. And that brings us, I think, very quickly to the legal question of what types of remedies are appropriate to deal with the impacts of climate change, including loss and damage. So a lot of the arguments in that case um, is focused on what types of reparations um, developed countries in particular should owe to developing countries. And that question of reparations ultimately becomes a factual question of how do we measure and assess loss and damage um, and other impacts of climate change. So as I think everyone on this call um, knows, developing an accurate picture of economic and non-economic loss and damage in the global south and um, in SIDS and LDCs in particular is quite difficult, but it is essential. And that's why I think this scholarship and this project is really um, fantastic because the type of locally led research that you're all doing and that you're going to provide um, is really the grassroots evidence which um, we need from SIDS and LDCs uh, in relation to the climate impacts there, which are the basis of the type of litigation that I do. So without that information, lawyers like um, me are not able to build cases to hold governments and increasingly corporations um, to account and hopefully achieve some climate justice for affected communities. And I think it is important to emphasize that um, the types of uh, cases that are uh, catalyzed by the work that you're doing are useful both for um, cases against governments and um, increasingly corporate liability. So I just wanted to provide two very quick examples of 
um, how the research that you're all doing could be useful for the types of climate cases that I work on. So on the topic of um, climate migration and displacement, um, I saw that Annie's research from Malawi focusing on displacement from flood prone areas um, uh, could be the type of information that could be vital evidence for a climate change case. So Annie is looking at the impacts of flooding on access to housing, sanitation, food and water um, and the rise in gender based violence connected to those climate impacts. And so to lawyers, all of those types of climate impacts are breaches of specific human rights, the right to food, the right to housing and so on. And so research uh, showing these imp impacts, substantiating them can be used as evidence by lawyers in a case against governments or corporations, both domestically and internationally, and obviously is very important to inform policy making um, as well. So another quick example is um, Lurvania's research in <clears throat> Brazil on how drought can affect um, cultural practices, access to food, um, water, and traditional ways of living. Um, and so where these impacts are on Indigenous communities in Brazil, for example, that would be breaching specific Indigenous rights and protections, which Indigenous people are owed. And again, research showing that type of impact could be used as the basis for, for example, a case at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, or even before the International Court of Justice. So I've only picked two um, examples from the research projects you have. I can think of a lot of different case ideas having looked at that list. Um, but my hope is that as you are doing uh, your work and your research, you'll start to think about, or at least have in mind, the fact that the work that you're doing can be useful for legal cases, um, particularly when you're quantifying non-economic loss and damage, which I don't think is captured very well um, at the moment and certainly not in, in the litigation <clears throat> that is happening. Um, so I'll close there. Um, I just want to, again, offer my sincere congratulations to all of the scholarship recipients um, I hope that you can get to know one another in this really amazing community. Um, and I also want to congratulate everyone at IED and, and ICAD um, for setting this up and also for publishing the, the CKIC, um toolkit. So I really look forward to seeing where this research goes in the next couple of years um, and how it's used by lawyers and, and policymakers in, in years to come. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Harj. And, and it's really um, encouraging to hear that you know, all the work that we'll be doing uh, or, or the scholars would be doing that would really feed into bringing about real change on the ground, uh, especially through policy making or through you know climate litigation and so on. So they can really look forward to some real change happening in terms of some reparation or some compensation for the for the losses that they're suffering. So uh, with that, uh, we will move on to the second segment. I, in fact, I was supposed to share with you the the all that we'll be covering in today's session. So we've covered the first uh, session where section of today's event where we were supposed to hear about uh, what this research and the CSEC toolkit can do in the space of um, uh, policy making and litigation and so on. Uh, but the second part is where we'll be hearing more about the Salim ul Haq's Memorial Scholarship, uh, who the researchers are, what are the areas they'll be covering in the research, and the and the and the the third part of today's event is where we will be discussing in great detail about the CSEC toolkit and how we'll be supporting not just the 25 scholars that we have selected, but generally overall the community of practitioners and how we can bring about uh, real capacity building, which could would also be supported by peer review and mentoring support and so on. So I'll just you know before we move on to hearing about what who the scholars are and what are the areas of research, a, a little bit of background as to how this memorial scholarship, uh, Salimullah Memorial Scholarship, came about, where we started from, and what it is meant to achieve uh, in due course. Because as Tom mentioned, this is not something that we plan to do for one year and then let it be. This is something that we want to continue building on so that we can, in due course, we can create a huge community of practitioners that continues to support policy making and so on. And 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 what are the, the gaps that we are really trying to address? One, we strongly believe that 
the real, the most insightful experts in the space of uh, climate change research or evidence building would be those experts who are already on the ground, who are helping community members and uh, confront, manage, and support recovery from a lot of these different types of climatic impact. And many of these climatic impacts are not just one type. Quite often, they 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 are occurring on top of all the other development issues that communities are already facing. So how are they really helping communities tide over those crises? And we really need those grounded practical knowledge because that would be the kind of knowledge that would help us understand, uh, get a nuanced understanding of how loss and damage uh, is really currently impacting the communities, identify the approaches that would be most useful or effective in tackling the different types of climatic uh, loss and damage that the communities are suffering, and also find out, because right now, you know, we do have some hope in the form of loss and damage fund. Uh, it is small, but yet if it can be uh, directed in the right way to the right kind of delivery mechanism through the right type of uh, financing uh, modalities as well, then we can reach out those who need it the most in a timely and effective manner. But before even doing that, we need to understand what, what are the models of solution behind which these money or these funds can be put uh, behind. And also how the existing sources of funded funding can be blended and matched with each other to bring about a greater impact on the ground so that it's more than some of its parts. So with that, the whole idea behind this scholarship is to recognize, one, the local expertise, create a more co-development approach because we know that a, a big issue that we have faced so far is that the research community in the Global South, they're not talking to each other. And when I'm saying talking to not, not talking to each other is because, you know, for a long time, climate research has been within the domain of climate experts. Whereas now we all know that the climate change is really becoming a development challenge. So, and it's become quite multidimensional as well. So unless we bring together experts from different domains to come together, talk to each other, we'll not be able to come out with that holistic solution that we want. And that is why we need a co-development approach. The third is the whole idea behind this scholarship is to also create a South-South capacity building. And we'll be talking more about how we want to create that. But not just capacity building, mentorship, and a peer support network. Because we heard Zinta where she said that, you know, IPCC would be looking forward to these evidence. But that evidence also has to be uh, properly peer reviewed, scientifically backed, so that we can be stand behind those evidence and research in any forum. And then really look towards the policymakers, not just at the international but level, but also at the national level. So the whole idea is to do all of this so that it helps then in coming out with context-specific solutions, uh, come out with research which helps develop actionable policies, but also linking those evidence then with dialogues at national, international, uh, local level. And we heard from Harj as well that how those uh, evidence can help in, in, in climate litigation, help in ensuring that you know, communities in some way get, um, uh, uh, they, they do get compensated for the loss and damage that they're already suffering. Now, just, you know, I, I don't want to bang on about what we have done in the past, but it is important for you to know that, you know, the work that we are doing under this scholarship is not, you know, not, you know, we are building on the learning that we already had in this space. So over the course of last three to four years, we have been supporting the authors from the Global South uh, by creating this mentorship network, capacity building effort. Uh, and we came out with, we supported close to 26 researchers in two batches and their uh, case studies got published in these two uh, publications that I put on the screen there. But one of the learnings that we also drew from these, this effort was while these case studies were good, but we also needed to come out with some like evidence of what's the scale of impact and not just the, the economic side of loss and damage, but also non-economic side of loss, loss and damage. And, and that prompted us to come up with the CSIC methodology because once you put the tables and hardcore evidence on the, on, on the table, only then can you push the policymakers, both at the national and international level, to take some proper actionable or come out with actionable solutions around them. So, and, and we have also created, because 
we know that just providing support to the scholars uh, would not be sufficient. We need to create uh, an enabling network of other practitioners. We need to create a, a mentors, uh, a, a group of mentors who would come together to keep supporting these authors in the same way or these researchers in the same way as you know, and we drew some learnings from the way PhD guides work with their uh, researchers. So the idea is to come out with a similar mentorship network, but the mentors network has to be, as I said, climate has become a development issue as well. So it it, it is in every in in every research uh, area that we would be looking at, there would be gender issues, there would be displacement issues, there would be health issues. So we need to bring together a group of mentors that support each of these areas, help the researchers understand how best they can address some of these areas. So the idea behind creating this loss and damage research observatory is to bring create provide a platform where some of these actors come together. And the idea is to not just support these 25, but go beyond that because we know there, you know, there's, you know, we have our limitations in terms of funding support that we can only support 25 this time. But the idea is to create a platform or a capacity building or toolkit that goes even goes beyond these set of 25. And, and when we launch these capacity building training program, it would not just be open to those 25 authors, but would be open to global community. So anyone who is researching in this space and wants to use these toolkit would be would be most welcome to come and join. They would be uh, right now we have created profile of 25 of these researchers, but we want to other researchers in the global south and north as well to come and create their profile, use this platform as a marketplace where they can share their experiences and expertise. We also know that many of these uh, people are not able to publish their blogs, their papers, their, their research output. So the idea is to also provide this research uh, loss and damage observatory as a platform where they can publish their papers. So, and, and of course we'll be having a clearing house that will assess the quality of those publications, but at least they'll have a place where they'll come and publish their papers and for others to discover those evidence. And the idea is to also, so we've also uh, created this, as you see, there's a resource hub that we've created. So right now we have put the publications that were known to us here. And if you go on this website that you know we've highlighted there, these, these publications can be searched on the basis of country, region, category, and subcategories of non-economic loss and damage. And, and in due course, as people as submit their publications, blogs, and articles, we would keep putting them in this global resource hub so that anyone can discover those papers. Uh, I also wanted to introduce you to one of my colleagues, P. Krishnamurti. Many of the scholars have already received my uh, emails uh, from him. He'll be the one coordinating a lot of work around loss and damage observatory. Uh, and uh, we will encourage you to, there is a query section. So if you have any questions, and, and again, I'm not just talking about the 25 uh, scholars that we have. Of course, we'll be providing them a very strong handholding support. But the idea is that if you have any questions, if you want to learn more about the toolkit, how to join the observatory, become a mentor, we'll be there to support you and help you. I would also want you to meet some of our master mentors that, and all of these five master mentors, four of them have supported the two round of publications that we already had earlier. So they'll also be there to answer any query, any questions that you might have as we go about. Um, as I said, the idea is to create an enabling environment where all the authors and, and other wider community of practitioners get supported. So with that, I'll stop sharing and I would want to pass on to my colleague uh, Rashi who would talk more about uh, the, the kind of research, like what was the whole selection process because we also want to be transparent. Uh, we, we got a lot of uh, uh, applications around the, the scholarship. And our hands were tied because we could only select 25, but we wanted to ensure that it was quite representative. Um, so over to you, Rashi. And she'll be able to explain how we went about selecting these authors um, and, and how they'll be uh, supporting. So uh, hello, and thank you all uh, for joining us today. Uh, as Ritu said, I'll be sharing 
we'll, we'll be giving a overview of the review process that we followed for the Salim Ulaq, um scholarship uh, and award for loss and damage research, which aims to uh, bring to the forefront the, the current issue, which is loss and damage. So the objective, although Ritu had explained it uh, very in a very detailed manner, but just to give you a quick recap of the objectives. So this scholarship reflects the three principles that Professor Salim Muhlak um, ardently advocated. And these are inclusivity, collaboration, and a deep commitment to understanding and adding uh, um, the multifaceted uh, impacts of climate change. And the three goals, the three primary goals are, number one, advance research impact and visibility from least developed um, countries and small island developing states, um, empowering local expertise by building their capacities. And third is promote South, South um, and global collaboration to encourage um, exchange of uh, knowledge exchange. Uh, the Salim Bullock Scholarship and Award for Loss and Damage was launched on June 16, 2024, with the applications open until June 30th. And the applications, we received applications under five categories of non-economic loss and damage, loss of cultural heritage, loss of quality of life, mental and physical health impacts, social disruption, and loss of ecosystem and biodiversity. Um, this, so we received 206 applications. This is a category-wise breakup of applications received. Uh, so as you, key, as you can see from the graph on your screen, we received maximum applications under loss of quality of life. And we got a good represent, I mean, good cases under other categories as well, but the highest cases were received for loss of quality of uh, life. Uh, in terms of regional distribution, the majority of applications, as you can see, uh, came from South Asia, uh, accounting for 45% of the total, uh, followed closely by the Sub-Saharan Africa with 44%. However, we did receive applications from all other regions as well, but not, I mean, the good, re I mean, high representation was from South Asia and um, South African regions. We also received these applications from a total of 48 countries reflecting the global interest in this crucial area of climate research. Uh, moving on to the main section of this presentation, uh, the, I'll give you an overview of how, what criteria and the, um, the process that we followed in reviewing the applications and shortlisting and finally selecting them. Uh, to ensure a fair and comprehensive selection process, we evaluated the applications based on these four key criteria, as you can see on the screen. Number one, the quality of content. The primary focus was on uh, the quality of the content. However, it was not the sole criterion. Uh, and the focus was also on the contribution each application could make to the make to advancing literature on climate-induced loss and damage. But we also gave special considerations to low-income countries and under-researched regions and the regions from where the cases were very few. Second was category, so balanced representation across all the five categories. Uh, and five applications were selected from each of the five categories of non-economic loss and damage, ensuring that all uh, aspects were well covered. Third was diversity of climate events. So we ensure that a wide range of uh, climate related events uh, are covered and were represented capturing both slow onset and rapid onset events. And the fourth was geographic representation. Uh, our selection process aimed to ensure fair representation from regions um, across the globe. And we also ensure that the country level representation is also balanced, so we sought to limit selection uh, uh, to one case per country. However, except for countries like Bangladesh and Kenya, we had a lot of cases and good quality cases. And so where the quality and diversity of applications were justified by selecting more than one, otherwise we ensure that we do not repeat the countries uh, so as to ensure that representation is equal across all the countries. Moving on to the review process, so it was a the selection process involved four main steps. 
Step one was around categorization of the applications. So we began with categorizing the applications across the all five categories, flagging the duplicates and incomplete submissions or those that didn't clearly align with the loss and damage categories. Uh, eligible applications when then were then sorted on the factors uh, such as geographic region, type of climate extreme events that are being covered and specific impacts of climate change. Step two involved defining the shortlisted criteria and ensuring regional representation. So we defined our shortlisting criteria that I just explained uh, in the previous slides with the goal of achieving broad regional representation and ensuring that all categories were covered. And this step allowed us to balance the quality and diversity across regions. Step three involved expert review of applications. So here each application underwent a rigorous review uh, by a panel of four experts who were also involved in the previous cycles of uh, the loss and damage case study uh, compendium development. So in the first review round, what we did were, was that the applications were summarized with the key issues that were highlighted. Followed by the second round of review, the panel assessed the applications for their originality, relevance, and feasibility, and then categorized them as shortlisted, waitlisted, and uh, the ones that were not selected. The step four was the final step, where uh, which involved discussion and final selection. So the final stage involved in-depth discussions among the review teams to finalize the shortlist and the high quality of submissions, particularly from South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, made this phase a bit challenging for all of us, but our goal was to select applications uh, representing the goals of the scholarship while ensuring that regional and thematic balances uh, ensured. Out of the total 206 uh, applications, 25 were selected, five under each category. And the world map on your screen shows geographic representation of research areas based on the selected scholar applications. So the regions, the countries highlighted in this map are the ones where uh, the researchers will, would be um, studying the topics identified by them and submitted in their applications. Thank you. Over to you, Ritu. Thank you so much, Rashi. So we'll now be moving on to the actual researchers and, and congratulations again to all of those who were selected. You know, as Rashi explained, the selection process was quite rigorous and uh, not to say that those who did not make it where their applications were not good, but you know, we had limitations in terms of who we could select. So I'll, you know, we have, as Rashi was mentioning, we have the applications, all the, the finalists in classified into five categories. So I'll be calling in our uh, finalists in each of those five categories, starting first from the loss of quality of life. So, and each of our uh, finalists will just be introducing themselves and talking briefly about the area of research. So first of all, I'll call uh, Cyril Ifong uh, from Nigeria. Cyril. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cyril Ifong. I'm a researcher a teaching and research assistant at the University of Birmingham. Uh, my work focuses on resilience of river-based livelihood on flood-prone areas in Nigeria. So I'm happy to be working closely with IIED, and um, I hope my research um, ideas will bring good innovation to climate global community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cyril. I also request Krishna to please uh, put the link to the profile of all the scholars in the in the chat message. Uh, but next, I'll call Ko, uh, Kosar Bano uh, from Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kosar. Uh, I work as a gender advisor with ADRRN, which works with 20 countries at South, sorry, Asia level. Previously, I was with ECMOD working for eight countries of South Asia and HKH. Um, I actually, uh, back, main background was uh, development, but then I uh, switched to the research and now focusing more on advocacy and research. 
My current project is all about gloves. As you know that um, in my previous work also, I have focused on mountains and in mountains, we are just facing gloves quite often. In my own village, which is Hunza, um, almost every year we are having gloves and the uh, loss and damage it is causing is really, really, uh, although as you have already mentioned that we, we measure the economic losses, but the loss of uh, invisible things, for instance, for women, uh, um, the cultural loss or religious and uh, spiritual loss, because women and uh, people are really very much attached in terms of spirituality with the uh, glaciers and all. When, it, when they see all these events, then they face quite a lot of disturbance during. So I wanted to explore more about and bring the nuances from the ground to the um, national and international, international level. So I got this opportunity and I'm very much looking forward to contribute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kosar. I think Pia Mohan is not around. Like uh, three of our researchers are not able to join. Uh, um, um, sorry, I'm here with two. Okay, great. So great, Pia. So Pia, why don't you go next? Uh, Pia is from Dominica. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, firstly, thank you for selecting my research project. I'm very happy to be representing the Caribbean. Uh, my, my project looks at Dominica, but I'm actually based uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm a senior research fellow at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Uh, my research looks at sustainable development in SIDS. Uh, I've looked at disaster impacts, in particular hurricanes, and of course, building climate resilience through uh, knowledge economies, diversification, et cetera. And my research also looks at um, finance and mechanisms, climate finance and building climate resilience. Uh, my research project looks at uh, Dominica's private sector and the experiences, particularly from Hurricane Maria and then Tropical Storm Erica. And I really hope to highlight the vulnerability of the business and communities in Dominica, uh, but more importantly, the resilient strategies that they would have adopted following these disasters. Once again, thank you uh, for selecting my project and I look forward to working with everyone. Thank you so much, Pia. Um, next, I'll go on to Laura Faith Bettino uh, from Philippines. Laura. Hi, good day, everyone. I'm Laura Batino from the Philippines. Um, and, and my research project will be focusing on local adaptation measures of small island barangays or villages and low-lying areas in the Philippines. So I'm looking into determining the adaptive capacities of these communities and the losses and damages that occur despite existing adaptation measures. So I'm happy to be selected as one of the scholars for this uh, memorial scholarship. And I also look forward to working with everybody else in the development of our respective um, research studies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And next, I'll go on to Navcha uh, Tukjamba uh, from Mongolia. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. And yeah. I'm really feeling honored to be part of this great community and thank you for selecting my project. And I, uh, as Rita said, I'm Mongolian, uh, but currently I'm residing in Australia, Sydney, because I completed my PhD at the Macquarie University. Now I'm working as a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Sydney. I'm geographer and environment scientist. And my research focus on nomadic pastoralist livelihood and pastoral ecosystems in the context of the climate change. So my main focus is the documenting how the local pastoralist knowledge and pra practices has uh, evolved and changed during the uh, with the climate change process. Also, how it integrated in the at least local level planning process. So through my this proposed research, I titled my project is from to Zot. Zot is the Mongolian term of the harsh winter. The combined effect of the drought and Zot brings 
huge amount of the loss and damage of uh, nomadic pastoralists is starting from the livestock loss. Thing is, it's uh, we easily count how, how many livestock we lost during this effect. And but we never considered or never counted how was the non-material in terms of the casual impacts is issues from this of loss of loss of. So I'm focusing to investigate how the this drought and drought impact drought related loss is impacting in this the nomad culture, daily livelihood, specifically the how it impacts on pastoralists, women and children. So I choose the gentle province of Mongolia because it's the one of the most vulnerable region of the country because of the transitions on from steep to desert, also the main core pastoral region. So this is briefly my research and I'm really looking forward to all of you. And thank you again. Yeah. Thank you so much. And then I'll now move on to this next category, which is the loss of cultural heritage. We have five scholars in that space. So first I'll call in uh, uh, Laurie Vanya Sores Santos from Brazil. Good morning. Hello, everyone. My name, my name is Laurie Vanya Sores Santos. I'm a Brazilian from the Northeast region, which has been heavily affected by draw. Brazil is currently experiencing the worst draw in our, astor, in our history. Uh, I am a professor at a public university in the state of Bahia, a member of Grassroots Women, platform practitioners of resilience led by Red Pintadas. And I'm part of the Wire Commission, a global movement led by women to apply their voices in important decisions that affect their lives in communities. It is a joy and a great responsibility to the parts of this observatory, which honors the legacy of Professor Salimul Hook, a great inspiration to us. I'd like to thank the organizers for choosing my history to, uh, to help build evidence and loss and damage and create effective policies to address these challenges. I also want to salute my fellow researchers I'm sure we're learning a lot together. Climate change does not affect everyone in the same way. Communities, traditional people, populations, and women are often the most affected. Limited access to resources and social inequalities leave these groups more vulnerable to violence, exploitation, and displacement after crisis. Our studies will help create a world in which communities are better prepared to face disasters. The focus of my research will be in the area cultural heritage and relationship to quality of life in Brazilian semi art. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, and you know, we ourselves work very closely with Huayru Commission. And in fact, in the last uh, in, in the last years of our work, we carried out a lot of shared learning dialogue in collaboration with uh, Grassroots Women Organization, which was through uh, Huayru Commission. Uh, and you also highlighted a very important point about co-learning. So the scholars learning from each other because each of those scholars would be uh, carrying out research in different space. So they might come up with different kinds of challenges. So it might be good to to co-learn and co-create uh, some of those uh, ways in which you can address some of those challenges as well. So I'll next call on Dr. Rupali Sehgal uh, from Bhutan. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Rupali, Rupali Sehgal. I teach uh, in the capacity of a senior lecturer in Bhutan. Um, I'm an Indian. Originally, I'm from India, but I've been uh, in Bhutan for quite some time now. I'm really intrigued by the culture of Bhutan, but also saddened by the way, you know, climate change is disrupting the Bhutanese culture. Um, I would be basically looking at how environmental shifts have led to changes in the food practices among the indigenous communities in Bhutan. Um, please allow me to also introduce one of my collaborators here, without whose help I wouldn't have been able to conceptualize the idea. So I'm very thankful to my friend and my colleague, Mr. Chencho Dorjit. If he's online, then Chencho. Uh, actually, I'm also working as one of the faculties out here in Royal Timbu College in Bhutan. 
So like just straight away to talk about my research interest, I'm also like really like uh, concerned about the current kind of shift that we see in uh, our uh, localities because of the climate change at the same time, how it often leads to change in the relational perspectives that eventually translating to laws and damage of our culture, heritage and traditions. And something that is like what my colleague shared and I also really like wanted to work and this kind of novel project something that we have been looking forward to and really like uh, looking forward to work with, with you all. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Uh, I'll now move on to uh, Dr. Amil, Amila uh, Lankapura uh, Lankapura uh, from Sri Lanka. Hi all and uh, I'm Amila Lankapura. I think a bit difficult to pronounce that anyway like uh, I'm Amila Lankapura from uh, Sri Lanka. So I'm an early career academic uh, attached to the Rajarata University of Sri Lanka. So uh, basically, I'm working on uh, research related to climate impacts, adaptation, resilience, vulnerability, and those as well as the loss and damage. So related to my journey, uh, I should especially mention related to this scholarship as well. A uh, couple of years back, like in 2022, I got uh, the fortune to be mentored by uh, Professor Saleh Mulhak in my uh, kind of a training program and Climate Resilience Academy uh, South Asian region. So from that point onwards, he has been, he has provided me that a very valuable mentorship and that was kind of a fortunate moment as well as today I'm so happy just to pay it back through in these sort of initiatives and like that. So it's it's great opportunity for myself. So uh, basically my team actually, uh, I mean, when we conceptualize our application, uh, basically let me just tell about what our application most relies on. That's about, uh, I mean, the loss of uh, intangible cultural heritage that is related to kind of a rural-based and woman-oriented and kind of a Russian reed weaving industry in the country. So that is kind of a rural-based, uh, a community-based as well as a group-based approach that is basically done by the rural woman and that has been affected by the climate change. And we are going to explore and uh, uncover about uh, that through this uh, opportunity. So in conceptualizing this uh, important concept, actually, there's another part uh, mainly played by uh, one of my colleague, uh, Dr. Sanjay Fernando. So uh, uh, let me just invite himself just to talk a little bit. I think he's in the program right now. Can I just invite him as well? I think we are a little bit tight on time, but uh, Sanjay, please come in if you can just quickly um, yeah. introduce yourself. I think um, you can see me. So hi everyone, I'm very glad to work back with you guys and so eager to uh, carry out our research. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So uh, with that, I'll go on to invite uh, SM Shaheem Alam from Bangladesh. Hello everyone, uh, this is Shaheen. Uh, actually, I'm a humanitarian worker and a social researcher. Now studying sociology at Gono Vishwavidalai uh, University, Dhaka, Bangladesh. So I have a wide range of experience in emergency response, relief distribution, leadership training, and mobilization. Here. Apart from that, uh, I'm a social researcher. I work already on uh, gender uh, inclusivity, disaster management, entrepreneurship, and Sundarban. So now I, I describe uh, uh, my project uh, uh, conserving Munda community cultural heritage. So this is the loss of cultural heritage. Uh, description, uh, the uh, project aims to document the Munda community's cultural heritage, which face the uh, base of uh, extension due to the climate vulnerabilities of the region and abject poverty resulting from the loss of livelihood. So thank you. Thank you so much, Shaheen. Uh... Then I'll call uh, Susan Bhattarai uh, from Nepal. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Sushan Bhattarai and I'm from Kathmandu. Um, I'm currently a researcher based at Achi Association in Ladakh, where I do work on conservation and restoration of 11th, 12th, and 13th century temples, um, which are under threat due to climate change and also things like mass tourism. Um, a lot of my work focuses on the highland districts of Nepal. Um, these are very unique places because they're, they are uh, some of the few places in the world where you can see a blend of Buddhist and pre-Buddhist cultures like the Bod religion. Um, and my former work has involved the climate displacement of um, people who live in these and also documenting things like the trans-Himalayan salt trade that used to happen prior to the 19th century. 
Um, for this scholarship award, my project will focus on a set of villages in the district of Mustang. Uh, Mustang is particularly special because it was only opened up for tourism in 1992. Um, and is very ill-prepared for climate change because of the type of earth and architecture they have. And also because um, they're not, this is a district that does not see rain and does not see a lot of flooding. Um, I'll be focusing on how we can preserve and create solutions to protect uh, tangible heritage. So things like monasteries and temples, but also intangible heritage like oral histories that have been passed down from generation to generation and traditions that are slowly being lost as people are being displaced from the villages where they were born. Um, thank you so much for selecting my um, project, and I look forward to working with everybody and learning from everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And with that, I'll move on to the third category, which is our mental and physical health impact. Uh, we have five uh, researchers in that space. So first, I'll call Sriti Pal. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really grateful and honored to be the, like, become the part of the finalist of this uh, Solimul Hawk Memorial Scholarship. Uh, originally, I'm from Bangladesh, and I actually had the privilege to meeting Dr. Hawk once, and it was like really uh, an inspiring moment. Uh, currently, I'm living in Germany and just recently uh, completed my master's in geography and environmental risk in human security from and actually, um, during this master's course, I actually got like really interested in this lost, uh, loss and damage uh, topic. And I also done my uh, thesis on non-economic loss and damage. And about the, this research, what I'm planning to do with this scholarship is basically I'm focusing, um, there's a investigating health impact uh, climate-induced loss and damage, particularly on women and girls. And the study will uh, try to explore how environmental uh, hazard like cyclones or sanitary intrusion affect reproductive health, uh, mental well-being, and their access to the healthcare. Uh, through different mixed method approach, I'll actually aim to identify the coping strategies and try, we'll try to propose an actionable solution to improve healthy beauty and resilience to the vulnerability community. Thank you so much. That's all for me. Uh, back to you, Ritu. Thanks, Riti. And next, I'll call Kansa Naeem from Pakistan. Uh, thank you, Rituji. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Hansa from Pakistan. I'm uh, basically a development practitioner and currently working as research associate at uh, Sustainable Development Policy Institute. Uh, which is independent policy uh, think tank. And my area of expertise are uh, climate change, migration, and gender. In addition, I served as a visiting faculty member at a public uh, university for two years where I taught uh, various economic courses. Uh, and I believe my research and teaching background provides me uh, with a solid foundation to pursue this scholarship opportunity. Uh, first and foremost, I'm uh, truly grateful to IIET and the partners for providing such an incredible platform and opportunity. Uh, in my previous studies, I found and the literature also supports that the women and uh, young girls are more vulnerable during climate-related events. Uh, they often face more challenges than men, some of which are uh, rooted in the cultural biases. For instance, in Pakistan, women, whether as uh, uh, mothers, daughters, or sisters, frequently skip their meals to ensure that the male family members are fed properly, ignoring the fact that it causes decline in their nutritional status. And uh, this is quite alarming in Pakistan. As recently, it is uh, stated by Sophie, uh, to, uh, re the report of 2024, that 41% uh, of women in Pakistan are anemic. Uh, so beyond uh, food insecurity, women also uh, face physical insecurity and uh, uh, the livelihood instability. Uh, in many cases, uh, men migrate to nearby cities, leaving women behind in their native towns to manage both domestic work and agriculture or livestock uh, responsibilities. So the dual uh, role of women add additional burdens uh, on uh, women. And uh, however, I have observed a new emerging trend where women are also started uh, migrating internally as unskilled uh, worker, particularly as domestic workers. And many of these women were previously engaged in the informal hand embroidery industry in their hometowns. Uh, but migration has made it difficult for them to continue this work in their new locations, which is causing a loss in their cultural heritage. 
in my research, I will explore uh, this emerging trend and examine how uh, we can empower women by formalizing and channeling their informal uh, home-based uh, livelihood into more structured uh, livelihood, uh, offering practical solutions to bridge this gap and improve their economic security. So they don't have to migrate. In case of migration, it may serve them for, uh, as women's situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kansa. So I'll now move to uh, Mohamed uh, Saila from Mali. Hello, everyone. My name is Mohamed Saila. I'm honored to be a finalist for the Saleh Moon Book Memorial Scholarship for the Loss and Damage Research. Really, I'm a, now I'm a consultant at uh, Anthropist for World, who was focused on uh, the change awareness and education, and also follow Harlem the Woman Believer, who was focus on uh, advocacy and sexual product in health, in mind change and uh, nutrition and education. Uh, my project title is uh, Excitement to the Impact of a Lot of Loss and Damage and Quality of Life in the Monero Community. This research will be conducted in the uh, neuro design is a region of Mali, a semi-arid area that has been heavily affected by the climate change, including severe drought and desertification. This call of in my research to evaluate how this climate introduced losses and impact of quality of life on this region, with the particular focus on the area such in the areas on the health, food, security, education, and uh, skill development. This project will use a mixed method approach from a qualitative interview with community members and local authority with the qualitative data collection to understand the tangible impact. Of, of community by examining the local adaptation strategy and identify critical gaps. The research aims to provide the region specific insights that will contribute to the global dialogue to loss and damages. Loss and damages. Thank you, Mamad. The, the, the finding in, in, in front of future policy and intervention to help in resilience and improve livelihood human vulnerability. Thank you for this opportunity and present work for your support and address the challenges for addressing the change in West Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. Uh, in fact, we are currently testing a CSEC toolkit in, in Mali, and it'll be great to get your feedback on that research as well. Uh, but okay. I'll... All right. Thank you. So I'll now okay. move on to uh, Dinio's uh, Sebi. Uh, from South Africa. Greetings, everyone. Uh, hello, uh, Ritu. Uh, so I'm Dinao Siabe uh, from Cape Town in South Africa. I'm currently working at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance um, in Cape Town at the University of Cape Town. Um, I, I work as a senior researcher and my areas of work around governance and development. So looking at um, democratic governance and development and issues of um, economic development. And the research that I'm going to be working on um, in this project is the mental and uh, or psychosocial impact of flooding um, in on women uh, in living in informal settlements in Cape Town, South Africa. So these uh, informal settlements, they were previously... Um, uh, organized under the Group Areas Act, where all the previously disadvantaged communities were moved into these areas, and they were only catering for limited uh, uh, population size. So what has happened is that people have basically organized their own forms of living, uh, housing, and these are mostly informal. The areas don't have proper sanitation or proper infrastructure. And on top of it, they were uh, built on top of floodplains, so they, there's no proper drainage. So every year, and this has been increasing over the years, is that they uh, become um, victims uh, of or, or negatively impacted by flooding. So in terms of interventions, they have focused on basically the drainage and also the infrastructure uh, involved. But um, a little has been done or there's been limited focus on the health and uh, health or health impacts, especially uh, psychological impacts, especially on women. So in these areas, given that they're impoverished, given this high level of, of unemployment, and South Africa is also now known as the um, uh, 
you know, the play, the country with a high uh, level of gender-based violence. So what happens is that during these periods of, of flooding, women's um, uh, safety is decreased, which obviously impacts on their uh, psychological well-being, but also their uh, methods of livelihoods get, um, get Im negatively impacted. But little work has been done on looking at, at the links between, um, so loss of uh, livelihood, loss of safety, on women. So uh, the research that I, I propose to do is to to interrogate this, these links uh, a bit further um, to to find what other what interventions can be put in place. So the aim is to influence policy, but also organisations working on, on the ground to find more gender sensitive uh, methods of um, intervening when these floods do take place. So that is the work that I'll be doing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, I'll now request the other uh, um, uh, researchers to be a little bit faster, like uh, quicker in, in their introduction. So with that, I'll move on to Mohammed Abdullah Harsi from GCDF, if he's around. Yes, Mohammed, uh, go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I am greeting all the organizers, partners, but, uh, partners. Uh, colleagues, mentors, and other researchers. I am Mohammed Abdullah Hirsi from Somalia. Uh, allow me to give a little bit overview of myself and my project. Uh, currently, uh, I am uh, busy in Somalia and I'm I serve the director of Global Environment, Climate and Development Foundation. Also, I am a faculty lecturer. Uh, basically, uh, in my research, uh, is focused on uh, discovering the impact of climate induced uh, loss and damage in Somalia, and as a case studies of Posaso, Pardo, uh, Gurawe, and Galkayo, uh, four districts that are northeastern part of Somalia. Uh, basically, uh, in this project, uh, it's focusing on how climate change how climate change uh, is exhibiting the disruption of quality of life. Uh, finally, uh, I am grateful to be one of the recipients of this scholarship, and I am very excited to be to exchange the knowledge and experience, research papers uh, with other researchers and mentors, and I wish this program will be more contributing to the loss and damage uh, uh, area. Thank you very much. Over to you, Rito. Thank you. And the next, we'll move on to the next category, which is the loss of ecosystem and biodiversity, always a very complex area to assess. Uh, so I'll call the first uh, researcher, Dr. Uh, Neil Young. Yeah, hello. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neil Young from uh, India. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer, IAED and the associate partner for uh, selecting me as one of the scholar from uh, Okay, um, I have completed my PhD in sociology and I've conducted uh, ethnographic study among the Mishin community in Mishin, in Assam, in Brahmaputra. And um, my work has been uh, around, like I examined the, basically the hydro-social relations among to the, the Mishings and various other communities, but specifically focused on Mishin. I am very excited for this fellowship because this will be an extension of my PhD research. Uh, in my PhD research, I have not specifically looked at loss and damage, but uh, this will be, this will be uh, exciting for me. It is very exciting for me because this will be more of, more of an extension of my work, the relations, uh, uh, the, the flood, the hydro, basically the hydro-social relations among the mission community, uh, but also to look at the, uh, the, the loss and damage due to uh, the flood and flood and erosion induced basically because of the climate change, uh, loss in terms of uh, ecosystem, as well as in terms of cultural heritage. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Uh, we'll go on to Wilson Licon uh, from Ecuador. Okay. Hey. Okay. Um, uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Wilson Lechon. I am from Ecuador currently. Uh, I work advising to 23 provinces of Ecuador on climate change. Um, 
Also uh, participate in international climate negotiation. Uh, my research um, topic uh, are climate change, rights analysis, analysis, climate governance, Arab biodiversity, and indigenous people's livelihood. <laughs> my research uh, topic is um, on the analysis of loss and damage at the subnational level focus on uh, management of uh, ecosystem, uh, which objective is to establish a, a methodology to evaluate the uh, um, losses um, and damage at the subnational level, go subnational government level, because uh, the local government um, uh, are currently facing irreversible impacts of uh, of climate change, uh, so so it is a, a priority uh, to regenerate generate information and tools for decision uh, making. Yes, it uh, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wilson. And I'll next request uh, Humphrey uh, Agavi uh, from Kenya. Yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Humphrey Agavi from Kenya. And I want to appreciate for being considered to be among the uh, recipients of this scholarship and also to be uh, among the scholars of this particular uh, scholarship. Uh, my focus will be on Kakamega uh, Forest, which is a tropical rainforest. And uh, it is actually one of the remnants of uh, tropical forest in Kenya and it supports uh, livelihoods of many communities around and mostly the indigenous communities. Uh, so you find that uh, these communities depend on the forest for livelihoods because of the ecosystem goods and services that the forest provides. So you find that the forest is threatened by two aspects. One is the deforestation because of the increasing population. And number two is because of the climate change. So uh, these communities that are indigenous also part of the sub-tribe of this community depend on the forest for conducting some of the cultural practices. So I will be interested in looking at the effects of loss and damage to these communities and how this has affected also the, customary, the customs of uh, these communities from maybe undertaking these activities. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, next, next request, uh, Kudakaveshi Chuma from uh, Zimbabwe. So thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kudakwashi Chuma from Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm currently working as programs assistant at Wildlife Conservation Action, mainly focusing on environmental sustainability and climate change research. So my research will be mainly focusing on the nexus or the links between biodiversity conservation and community life loss, looking at how climate change is uh, uh, impacting or on uh, community life loads, uh, for instance, how climate change is exacerbating the loss and the damage caused by wildlife species. Thank you. We can go on to the next category, which is which is the last category, which is on social disruption, which includes both migration and displacement. So first, I'll it's my pleasure to call uh, uh, Shakirol from Okup. We've been partnering with them to carry out another research in Bangladesh. So I'm really pleased to have him as one of the finalists uh, in this category. So, Shakirul. Uh, thank you, Ritu. Thank you very much. And hi, everyone. Uh, good evening from Bangladesh. My name is Shakirul Islam, and I represent a grassroots migrant organization in Bangladesh known as Obhibashi Kurimu Non Program. In short, it's OCAP, we call it. Uh, I'm a, basically a migrant activist and researcher, and uh, currently I'm serving as the chair of uh, Obhibashi Kurimu Non Program. Founded in 2004, OCAP emerged as a platform for returning migrant workers and their families. Our executive director, who himself is a returning migrant worker, initiated this movement to raise the voices of migrant workers and protect their rights and dignity, regardless of their legal status or gender. 
Over the years, uh, we have recognized the unique challenges uh, that the migrant workers face, especially those in the coastal uh, areas of Bangladesh uh, who are deeply affected by climate change. And uh, since 2018, we have focused uh, on both research and uh, action projects to explore the links between climate change and migration and to craft rights-based community-led solutions that promote sustainable adaptation and resilience. Today is a very significant day for OCA. We are honored to be considered for this uh, Salimul Haq Memorial Scholarship and Award. And I would like to take this opportunity to remember Dr. Hawk, whose outstanding contributions to global climate change advocacy continue to inspire us. I extend my sincere thanks uh, to IIED, ICERT, and everyone involved in the process for extending this opportunity to us. With this scholarship, uh, we are very much excited to begin a new research under the mentorship of ICERT, uh, IIED. Our aim is to gather evidence on how climate-induced disasters, both um, slow and onset, uh, uh, a sudden onset, uh, lead to economic and non-economic loss and damage, and how they drive forced and unsafe migration, and how these factors increase the vulnerability and rights violations of affected communities, particularly in the Shundarbon regions in Bangladesh. We will employ a mixed method approach blending quantitative data with the lived experiences of those most affected. Uh, the findings will help inform policy discussions on a rights-based approach to climate-induced migration, emphasizing both the right to stay and right to move while addressing loss and damage, and building resilience. And uh, I have a few of my colleagues here present. So considering that time limitations, I'll request them to say hello through the chat box. And I thank you uh, again, everybody, for, for your time and attention. Thank you very much Thanks. for the opportunity. Ritu. Thanks, Shakiro. So, um, and with that, we'll move on to Annie uh, Mapulanga uh, from Malawi. Has mentioned about the research, so it will be great to hear it from her own. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Annie, Annie Maplanga. I'm from Malawi. And uh, I'm working with the Department of Disaster Management Affairs as an economist. So I'm an economist and a humanitarian worker. So I'm involved in emergency preparedness and response. So as indicated earlier on, my research is on the on the social disruptions, especially on the issue of migration and displacement, because uh, when in Malawi we experienced the tropical cyclone Freddy, which induced a lot of floods, uh, most of the communities were were displaced, and uh, we also relocated some of the communities. So my research revolves around that to find uh, ways on how best we can. Uh, we can uh, those communities can recover and also reconstruct and also for their livelihoods to go back to normal. So the factors and also as well as looking at um, finding out on how the relocated communities are living in the host communities, what are the opportunities, the challenges, and the key recommendations as well as uh, quantifying some of the non-economic. Uh, loss and damage. So my focus is on the southern region of Malawi, which is in one of the districts heavily affected uh, by floods and the tropical cyclone Freddy. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity and to be part of the this amazing team. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Annie. And I'll then move on to Achillam Emmanuel from Uganda. Yes, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from uh, Stockholm University. I was doing a master's in environmental law. Currently, I am uh, a researcher and the board director of uh, Terra Legal Research Center. My research uh, will be focused uh, majorly in the Karamoja sub-region, in the regions of Uganda, and uh, about 82% of the community actually uh, are living uh, below the poverty line. So my research is basically on uh, climate mobility, uh, that is uh, climate-induced uh, mobility in the Karamoja uh, sub-region and how this has affected uh, 
uh, the society, social disruption, and also caused uh, migration in that area. One of the, the, the inspiration behind uh, my research was uh, the issue of street children in the capital of Uganda and other urban centers. And uh, my analysis on what, what is seen is that most of uh, the street children uh, in Kampala and other urban centers are from uh, the Karamoja sub-region of Uganda. So what my research will be doing is basically establishing this link uh, between uh, effects of climate change, uh, such as drought, uh, that is the main uh, uh, problem that is faced, uh, climate change impact that is faced in Karamoja, and how the drought, famine, and poverty in Karamoja has uh, led to uh, this migration. So I'll be connecting it to human rights and other aspects as well. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. And uh, next, I'll request Diu Lin Din from Vietnam. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lin. I'm from Vietnam. Thank you very much for selecting me as one of the recipients for the scholarship. A little bit about me, um, I had a bachelor degree in agricultural sciences, and I'm currently completing my master's degree in development studies, specialized in applied development economics. I just submitted a dissertation on free trade agreement and coffee export from Vietnam a few weeks ago, and think across that it come through. Um, um, in between my degree, I work as a project coordinator for an official direct assistance program in Vietnam, from which I gained firsthand experience with ethnic minority and rural development. Um, this has greatly influenced my application to the scholarship. So regarding my proposed topic, the context of my research would be in Vietnam as um, according to the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, Vietnam would be one of the most heavily affected country by the climate change. Um, I'm, I'm interested in addressing the impact of climate change in on agriculture because half of the population is still engaged in agricultural work. So you can imagine how widespread and severe the impact would be. Um, so I propose to research on the potential displacement impact um, of adverse weather such as extreme heat, prolonged drought, and unusual rainfall on the agricultural communities. Uh, so I look forward to developing my research further to the program. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to the next category. Obviously, we are running a little bit, not little, quite late. So I'll go ahead and share my presentation, uh, which is uh, which I'm going to really move very fast. But um, uh, do not worry if you are interested in learning more about the CSEC toolkit. We will be uh, launching a more detailed um, training or tutorial, not just for the scholars, but also more widely for everybody else. Just to give you a quick overview of what the CSEC toolkit is, basically, we have tried to bring together a lot of different uh, methods uh, and, and processes and approaches that, that can help us quantify both economic and non-economic side of loss and damage more comprehensively. But we know that when we talk about economic assessment, we come across some very complicated methodologies. But the idea behind this is to to simplify some of these or demystify some of these complex analytical method in a way that it becomes more straightforward, easy to understand, even for the local researchers, organizations who do not have economics background. Uh, and we have tried to make it versatile enough so that it can be applied to a range of uh, geographic as well as social context. Now, you know, as you see, it is a combination of different methodologies, but also steps. And I'll just, and what, if you go through the CSEC toolkit itself, and I'll request my colleague to paste the link to the toolkit again in the chat box, is basically we have combined different steps and stages. You go through a toolkit, ideally, we have provided a lot of examples uh, and practical ways in which you can calculate. And we have tried to draw in examples from different uh, context, for example, from loss of livelihood, so loss of uh, biodiversity, social disruption, mental health, physical health impact. So we try to cover all of these different contexts so you can understand how the same toolkit can be applied in different uh, type of research areas. So basically, this is an overview of how the toolkit ap approaches this issue, right from the co-identification of issues to the final working out what the solutions might look like in different contexts. So 
and I'm, what I'm going to do in my presentation is quickly to take you through what this toolkit covers. But obviously, we will not be able to explain everything. If you go through IDS, you go through the toolkit in detail, you'll understand what it is. But at the same time, we'll, as, we, as I said, we will be focusing on, on launching a more detailed series of tutorials on capacity building. So, uh, so having said that, I'll just quickly take you through the overview of this, this toolkit. So very first step is to undertake inclusive and participatory community appraisals. Basically, it builds on, you know, some of you may be aware of the participatory rural appraisal process that we had. And we are very thankful to two of the local research organization, Feathers, uh, as well as Manaswani, which really helped us uh, pilot test some of these approaches on the ground, whether these tools or these methods can really work when, it, when we talk about assessing uh, the economic and non-economic loss and damage impact. So, for example, if you are aware of some of the, the methods or approaches that we used during the, uh, in the PRA exercises, we've used, you know, the same approaches, but in a way that it helps us understand some of the underlying factors uh, or the impacts of climate change. Now, you know, what you see on the screen here is basically a sample of how this this uh, transact pack was conducted in one of the field areas where we have tried to understand what are the existing sources, uh, what are the existing problems or issues that climate change creates for them, and what are the opportunities that we can be can be reaped when we especially try to work out solutions for those issues. Another uh, tool that we can use is around social mapping. Again, with the community's help itself, we ask them to map out where different communities stay, who are most vulnerable, who are marginalized communities, and what are the resources around them. And these, this kind of an assessment is really comes very handy when you try to work out who gets impacted when there's a flood, when there is a drought, or if you have to, if there's issue of uh, uh, lack of drinking water, who has to walk longer distance to collect drinking water and so on. And these are the things that you cannot easily work out. But if you work, if you work with the community itself, you come out with a very strong sense of what the real issues and challenges are on the ground. Again, another method that can be used is hazard and resource mapping, where you engage the community itself to understand how different impacts are, uh, climatic impacts are affecting them. Another way in which you can do sometimes in a lot of areas, we have seen that historical data is not available around climate uh, impacts or you know how those climate change patterns are really impacting uh, on their land use, on their natural resources, farmings and livelihood. And this is a very good, good way of mapping that with the help of community itself. We have explained how all of this can be carried out. Again, a big impact, as you've heard from some of the researchers as well, uh, that mobility, displacement is a big issue. Social disruption is a big issue. So it is a, it would be important to understand from the community how this really happens. Uh, what are the different modes of transport they take? How long they, do they uh, undertake displacement? Or, or what's the cycle of their displacement or internal migration? Matrix ranking again becomes important because many of when you talk about non-economic loss and damage, it is up to the community to explain to us what they value. And there's some, sometimes we as outsiders really don't know what is really uh, valuable to the community, but sometimes the things that we don't consider valuable might be of great importance to the community. So it's important to understand for the community itself as to what are the different issues, how do they rank them, and so on. Perception mapping, again, when you talk about finding out solutions, it is important to understand how are the existing institutions working within the community? What are the existing programs, social protection program or DRR response mechanism uh, in the community and how effectively are those institutions working? So this would give you an assessment or an idea of uh, what are the, uh, like, where do you really need to focus your attention or, uh, attention on? Again, seasonal calendar is another way of finding out. For example, here, uh, our, our, uh, our partners try to understand from the community as to how, when they're hit by a climatic impact, what are the kind of health-related issues it creates. Now, this is just an example. You know, as I said, you know, we have tried to demystify or try to unpack that, uh, this toolkit to explain how it can work in different contexts and uh, situations. The basic idea behind this first step would be to work out what are the predisposing factors? And here, why we are calling it, and we typically call it a 3P uh, approach, mm -hmm. where we call it, why? Because we understand that the climate impact when it happens, it is happening in different contexts, diverse contexts. And 
and each of these different areas development issues might already be persisting like they would be women they would be gender issues they would be marginalized communities they would be weak institutions so we really need to understand how climate is interacting with some of those predisposing or development deficit factors to create compounding impact and we also need to understand the protective factors because if the if there's a lack of good social protection program or drr or other uh, protective or safety net that can come in handy uh, for communities to protect themselves or to to protect the vulnerable communities from some from some of these climatic impacts it is also important to understand the state of their implementation or is it really reaching the the communities who really need it or are there any issues or challenges with its targeting and so on so what this this first step would do is to help you unpack some of these predisposing factor the precipitating factor as well as the state of protective uh, factors and then this, once you have done that the second step would be to un, to use a taxonomical approach to unpack these these factors further uh, and and in the toolkit we have explained uh, how these could be done as i said it's a taxonomical approach so basically we have identified four taxonomies like demographic factor social factor economic and political factor and we have also given a list of indicative factors that you could assess obviously these are not exhaustive they could be other factors as well so feel free to add or delete or you know uh, consider some other factors but basically this is to give you an understanding of how you could really unpack them how you could really organize these factors to understand the interaction with the precipitating factor again precipitating factor is important to understand because quite often we think we say that this is a drought prone area but the same area could be both drought prone as well as flood prone the same area could also be impacted by cyclone or salination and so on so it is important to unpack all of those factors and understand how they are interacting with the predisposing factor and again the state of protective factor you need to understand from the uh, consideration of what are the social protection program for women children uh, what are the financial safety net what are the protection available for the migrant or displaced communities and and, and what is the state of situ of institution and then work out the interaction because you know it is the impact never stops at one level so it sets in motion a dominoes effect uh, where that the same impact if not provided if the community is not provided adequate safety net then it leads to secondary and then the tertiary impact so it is important to understand what are the series of impact it creates one after another and how does one impact lead to another impact and then work this this whole aspect out so that you can then figure out the range of impact it's creating both economic as well as non economic and that will take you to the third Uh, step which is the categorization of both economic and non economic loss and damage now typically categorization we we have suggested in to six domains again it is tangible intangible functional and intrinsic temporal and spatial now these terms in itself might seem quite complicated but if you go into the toolkit you will see that we have tried to unpack explain each of these terms in as simple language as possible and with a lot of examples so you can understand you know what these terms really mean again a point of caution here is what is intangible in one context might not be intangible in others and similarly what could be functional in one context could be intrinsic in some other context so there is no set definition that these are the things that would fall in intrinsic these are the things that would fall in functional and so on and in the in the toolkit we have also analyzed five case studies to explain how this categorization can be done for different and these are live these are real case studies which we have used to analyze how you can categorize these loss and damage uh, into different you know, those six domains that i just talked about for example for loss of quality of life we have looked at a case study from nigeria Uh, for loss of ecosystem and biodiversity again a case study from botswana like why we have done this so that you can understand that the same toolkit or the same approach can be applied in a range of context and by no way it means that you know for all the loss of biodiversity case studies uh, or research you have to categorize them in these uh, under these indicators 
this is just for Botswana's case, but it could be different for different uh, um, uh, context. Again, loss of cultural heritage. We have used the case study of Fiji. Uh, and then for social disruption migration, we have used a case study from Tamil Nadu, India. And then finally, this is a case study which we have presented for the uh, in the case of mental and physical health impact. This is also a case where we have actually practically tested this toolkit, which was in the case of uh, Bead District in Maharashtra in India again. Now, the fourth, and this is the most important uh, step, where we've used index-based valuation approach to assess the overall, like the range of climatic impact, and also attach a value to them. And this can sound a bit complicated, but we've used three different uh, tools or approaches, so economic valuation, multi-criteria, decision-making, MCDM, or composite risk index. Now, with the participatory uh, appraisal, you understand the range of factors that you can then classify and categorize. But for, for assessing these under, for index-based valuation approach, you will have to de develop household surveys, focus group discussion, KIIs, and use other tools to assess uh, these, these um, uh, econ uh, undertake economic valuation. Now, in the toolkit, you will see that we have used, we have explained each of these ways in which you can carry out the economic valuation of these both economic and non-economic loss and damage. For example, repeal preference method, stator preference method, direct, indirect, hedonic pricing method. So for each of these methods, we have explained, demystified them, explained them with a range of examples, and even how you could work out models for calculating them. Now, the idea is for you, like nobody who does not, anyone who does not have an economic background to say that I do not understand, maybe this is not my, uh, this is not something I can do. Anyone who can, like, and we have tried to use simple languages so that you can read through and understand. But of course, we'll also be conducting training programs, which will help you understand these uh, aspects better. MCDM, again, becomes very important because a lot of our economic valuation would be based on community perception. And it is important for us to use the community ranking method as to what they think is important to them. And then finally, quantifying, we've used uh, this, this by far is the composite risk index is something that would be really valuable for you. Uh, basically, you'll have to work out first the different domains of interactions. Uh, and now I'm really going fast because I know we do need to bring in uh, other, uh, but you know, the basic idea is, you, you understand these different domains of interaction, for example, tangible functional loss and damage. Now, within that, you have to work out different indexes, as you see, loss of income index, water scarcity, drudgery index. But for each of these indexes, you then, in order for you to quantify them, you have to work on different indicators. And we have just given examples of how this could be done, you know, for different. But, you know, basic idea is for you to understand, like, how that can, how these indexes and sub-indices can be worked out and then uh, they can be valued. So in our, when we tested this toolkit out in Beat District, and now we are testing this out in Mali, uh, we have, based on our assessment, we attach a monetary value to all of them. Now, finally, the idea is not to just come out with issues or quantify these are the scale of impact, but also to come out with solutions. And for solution, we again go back to the participatory method, and we have explained how, once you have done the quantification, how you go back to the community again, map the existing resources, identify gaps, and then map the existing programs. And we have provided a matrix to you as to how you could then start identifying the areas of solutions, uh, identifying who the stakeholders could be involved, what could be the actions, and, and then so on and so forth. But the idea is to then take the community through this ladder of resilience building, like create an absorptive resilience, adaptive resilience, and transformative resilience. Now, this is the overall framework like right from identifying the problem to identifying final solutions. And, uh, you know, very quickly introducing two of my colleagues, Kartikeyan and Krishnamurthy. Uh, you know, I, along with them, we'll be conducting a lot of training programs for everyone. Uh, and, um, and, and again, these training programs would be open to all. So anyone uh, who has an interest can come in and join and learn from them. Uh, ideally, we would want to conduct these training programs for five different categories of loss and damage so you can contextualize how this tool can be applied in different uh, situations. So I know we are really running late and I'm really thankful that, um, and, and you know, things like these cannot be done without the funding support from 
uh, really generous donors and um, and one of the support that we've got is from uh, IDRC International Development Research Center and I would request uh, Bhim Adhikari the senior program specialist to come in and just talk uh, like you know share some of his thoughts uh, about how he sees the value of this research uh, in the mandate that IDRC has uh, and, and taking this whole thing forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ritu. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to be the part of this meeting uh, this, this morning. So as, as Ritu said, I'm Abhim Ajikari. I work for the IDRC's uh, Sustainable and Inclusive Economies Program. So, you know, I, I really would like to join, you know, previous speaker, you know, congratulating IID and ICAT for this very important initiative. So as you know, you know, as already mentioned, you know, Salim was, you know, our dear friend. Uh, he was our mentors. He was our. He was a great supporter of this kind of global cause. Uh, and you know, I also I knew a Salim long time ago, back in around two thousand, when I was doing my PhD in the UK. So that relation, you know, always uh, grew, you know, until you know I started something with him uh, back in COP twenty seven. We launched a new program in Los Angeles. So it's a really great initiative. I really would like to congratulate uh, both the CAD and I CAD. IID in ICAT. So, you know, many of you knew already that, you know, who, uh, what is IDRC? I, IDRC is a part of the government of Canada. We were created a, by Parliament of Canada in 1970. And our mandate is to support research in developing countries to promote uh, growth and uh, sustainable development. So, you know, usually we fulfill this mandate by supporting applied research, uh, building capacity, access to result and resources, you know, awards and fellowship like this one. And we also try to you know, facilitate network of the researchers, partners, and the donors as well. So if I remember correctly, you know, over the last 50 years, you know, IDRC has funded more than like uh, 20,000 research projects uh, involving more than like 6,000 institutions uh, and almost like more than 92 countries, particularly in the, you know, climate vulnerable region like SEEDS and LDCs. So I think listening, you know, everything this morning, I'm really delighted that you know the, the, this this initiative is really strongly aligned with you know IDRC's kind of mandate uh, because you know our, our our focus is basically you know uh, fostering innovation, innovative solutions, and uh, global challenges through locally produced issues and building capacity like this. So I see like a four kind of major areas you know why this is very important for IDRC. You know the first is like a building southern capacity. Uh, which is kind of DNA for IDRC because we always believe in the power of local experts and a local generated knowledge as well. So I think this policy, I, I'm really delighted, is so diverse. And we have colleagues throughout the almost entire all these three continents. There is a lot of lot of you know gender diversity here as well. So I think that will be this is a kind of building block, you know, for us a little really new to forward and with this new loss and damage kind of debate globally. So that's really good for us. I think it's like a, one of the bread and butter work for IDRC, this building southern capacity. And second, our focus is also how we can go about generating local knowledge. You know, most of the time in a topic like this, because we have seen in the past as well, there are a whole bunch of, you know, northern kind of dominant kind of research ideas. But I think this particular focus is really how we really can help the local researchers to generate the evidence and solution you know, that can inform, you know, both not only national policy, but the international policy. As, as as well, you know, again, I think I would like to refer this, uh, you know, the focus on the non-economic loss and damage. I think which is going to be and many of the you spoke about the you know the cultural heritage restoration, well, uh, different kind of you know non-economic loss and damage. So I think this is really important. This kind of local knowledge, uh, where I think IDRC put a lot of emphasis on. So that that's a kind of second area where I really see see this initiative fitting very well. And also, I think the, how we can go about the, you know, kind of contributing to the global climate agenda through, you know, this kind of locally generated knowledge. So, uh, yeah, again, I think, you know, I, I personally believe that uh, this will contribute significantly to global evidence based on the climate impact. Because, again, I think we are currently lacking you know, more like a local knowledge, particularly loss and damage, because the, 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 the debate is pretty much global. So I think that this kind of work really will contribute to the global agenda. So, you know, and we'll be really coming with the more Southern perspective, you know, on this particular topic. So that's where I see also, you know, that fits pretty well. 
I, I, and something like on the very long term kind of sustainability that uh, both Tom and uh, Ritu highlighted earlier. So this is not a, just an initiative like a, a kind of one shot kind of initiative. We, we really see that there's a lot of potential here. And I, I'm really hopeful that we can also mobilize other donors kind of to continue, you know, this kind of capacity building model uh, in the global south. Not only fellowship itself, I think the uh, this, this tools as well that Ritu has just presented. So overall, yeah, these are the, I think, few kind of quick points. Uh, so many things have been said already. I don't want to take a lot of your time. But uh, finally, I really would like to congratulate, you know, congratulate all of you, the recipients. And I met some of you, like a, a Priya Mohan, I think I, I, I met virtually her when I was in Caribbean only this year. And so many of you, you know, like a kind of family faces, also some new kind of colleagues uh, really joining, you know, this kind of global report. So I, again, congratulate all of you. And I'm really looking forward to interact with you any any future type of event, either COP or any other kind of climate and loss and kind of event. So thank you so much again, and I'm really delighted. And from IDRC, you know, I, I really would like to assure you that uh, we will find a way really to continue, you know, this kind of very southern driven capacity building model in years to come. And also, you know, loss and damage, we have just started. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And again, I think, again, I'd like to thank IID and ICAD for taking this initiative forward. Uh, again, along with Thanks. this. Uh, Thanks all so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ritu. Uh, yeah, what yeah. you? Uh, thank you so much, Beam, for your kind words, and we look forward to your continued support. And uh, very quickly, I'll call in Dr. Tom Mitchell, our executive director, to give in his final words, and then I'll invite Shakib. So over to you, Tom. Thank you, Ritu. And what a wonderful session to hear from everybody, as Bim said, from so many different countries, different contexts. I think it's an incredible um, uh, testimony to Salim's legacy that we've been able to bring that diversity of, of perspective and, and, and the opportunity to build incredible capacity. And I think my dream, I suppose, for this scholarship is for us to move forward as a cohort, to strengthen each other, to share, to support each other best possible expertise. And huge thanks also to the partnership with IDRC and to, and to ICAD. And again, congratulations to all the scholarship recipients and my thanks also personally to the members of the team who've made this possible. So excited for the future. Thank you very much. Back to you, Ritu. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. And I'll invite uh, Shakib uh, Huck, who is Managing Director of ICAD, to come in and say uh, some few final thoughts. Thank you, Ritu, and thank you, Tom and Beam, and all our colleagues and our, our awardees. Congratulations to all of you. I'm very excited for the work that you're embarking upon. And I'll also make a, a special plug, as Beam mentioned, that there are a number of other activities that happen throughout the year that maybe a lot of us are converging on. So please do stay in touch with us. There are a number of um, activities that even our center is based in Bangladesh, but we work across several LDCs as well as IID colleagues that are based in different places. So please do keep in touch. Please do let us know where you are going. If there are workshops or activities that we're doing that are more locally based for you to be able to attend, we'd be happy to have you as participants. We have some upcoming workshops in Malawi as well as in Nepal. So if there are opportunities for us to be able to meet in person, please do avail them. Let us know where you're moving to on behalf of your research or outside activities. And please follow our activities that are happening both in person and online. So there are a number of ways that we might be able to enhance our collaborations going forward. And I'm very, very grateful for all the effort that the IID team have done in setting up the award and scholarship program, as well as a very comprehensive toolkit. Um, I'm very impressed in, in a lot of the activities that they're doing, and hopefully we'll be able to contribute and put in some more input from our side as well as from our colleagues and our networks. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming. And I'll hand back to Ritu and Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shakib. And uh, most importantly, a huge thanks and uh, congratulations to all the awardees and even the other uh, uh, applicants who could not make it to the final stage. But as I said, our resolve is to continue supporting people who are part of the uh, scholarship as well as those beyond it. We'll continue to provide them a platform for capacity building, but also if they have any research, they have blogs that they want to share their thoughts, they can come in and share that. We will publish it. Uh, that's our resolve. As Shakib says, the idea is to create a community of practitioners So and also create that mutually supporting uh, network. So we, we'll, you know, we'll 
ensure that we create opportunities through us, through our partners, uh, in a way that you get the platform, the grid, the visibility, uh, and you can you know, really represent your evidence, your knowledge at both national and international platform. So huge thanks. But I'll also take this opportunity to thank all my colleagues, uh, uh, Kartikeyan, Krishna, Krishnamurti, Rashi, uh, Swati, Devanshu, all of them made a, a huge amount of effort in making all of this possible. So thank you all so much.